an original presentation from America's premier audio theater group, Seeing Ear Theater. Weena? Weena? Oh, there you are. What have you found? See, stars. Stars in house. No, we know. Diamonds. Diamonds under glass. Diamonds? Stones. Stones? So bright. Like stars. Very pretty, yes. We know smiles. We know how? Sure. If I can get them out of there. Well, let's see. Um, ah, this, uh, this chair will do it. Here. For Wiener. To where? Oh, again, again. Oh, oh. Ow, uh, careful. Oh, 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 you've cut yourself. Oh, oh, oh. Hurt like fire. Here, hold finger. So. Come on. Find real fire. Fire here? I hope so. And, and tools. Tools? Yes, to open door. Then you and I, uh, uh, then Weena and Sam, go. Leave more lives. Come. The Time Machine, August 14th, 2003. A statement of Herbert G. Wells in the matter of the disappearance of his friend Samuel Lyman of the town of Cold Spring. Testimony made in my presence, Detective Johnson, and of two police officers of the town, and recorded by Mabel Milrod, town clerk. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that Sam was something of a reckless. So when he called to invite me over to his house, I was a bit surprised. Uh, this was in January of 2000, right after the big millennium thing. I remember that because he said, I'm going to show you something that will really put this year in the history books. By that, he meant this time machine thing, huh? Well, I suppose so. Now, at any rate. I didn't know what he was talking about at the time. Right. Go on. Well, <clears throat> when I showed up, I discovered that he had invited some other people, too. There was Arliss Kellett, who had been our science teacher in high school, and uh, Willie Flores who used to work with Sam at Bernard's Auto Body. And then there was this guy from the city, Jay Hoffman, his name was. He was a patent attorney or something like that. That's right, and Bernie said good things about you, too. Really? That's, that's great. Uh, come on in. Jay, this is Herb. Uh, Hi there. Good evening. Herb edits the local paper, and Arliss Kellett, our former science teacher, recently retired, right? That is correct. Good evening. And this here is Willie Flores, who knows more about your car's onboard computer than the company that built it. Hi, Willie. Hi. In fact, Willie here has been helping me design a device that will bring a whole new dimension to travel, even if he doesn't know what it is we've created. <laughs> That's true. But why don't you make yourselves at home here? Don't mind the clutter. And don't go peeking there, Willie. I'll show you guys what's under the spread in just a moment. All right. All right. Okay. But first, you have to listen to what I have to say very closely. And let me warn you that I'm about to turn a few widely accepted ideas on their ears. Sounds right. interesting. Really interesting. First off, the geometry we're all taught in school is based on a misconception. That seems a pretty broad statement to begin with, Sam. I promise I won't ask you to accept anything without a reasonable explanation, Miss Kellett. Now, you know that a line, a line of thickness nil, has no real existence, right? Right. Neither has a geometrical plane. These things are merely abstractions. Okay, I'm with you so far. Nor, having only length, breadth, and thickness, can a cube have a real existence. Now, there, I object. Of course a solid body may exist. All real things... So have... most people think. But wait a moment. Can an instantaneous cube exist? No, I don't follow you. Can a cube that does not last for any time at all have a real existence? No. Clearly, any real body must have extension in four directions. Length, breadth, thickness, and duration. Now, because we can see and feel the first three, we tend to draw an unreal distinction between the first three of these dimensions and the fourth dimension, which is time. 
Have you heard what is being said lately about the fourth dimension? I haven't followed this much since I read Einstein. You mean like that professor, what's his name, Larry Brill at Columbia? Bingo. The curve in the sky. I heard that guy on Newsline. Awesome. I agree. I've been working on four-dimensional geometry myself for several years now. Some of my results are pretty exciting. But wait, if time really is a fourth dimension of space, why has it always been considered as something different? And if it's the same kind of thing as height and width and uh, depth, why can't we move about in time the way we can move in the other dimensions of space? Exactly. The answer is, we can. <laughs> All right, Come on. Sam. Sam, Sam, please. Please. I mean, for real. But that's impossible. I promised I wouldn't ask you to believe any unreasonable assertion, Arliss, and you can hold me to that. I'll try, anyway. But if I can make something real move in time before your very eyes, will you believe me then? I guess so. Sure. How about the rest of you? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, all right. I'll drive you straight to the U.S. Patent Office myself. (laughs) All right, then. Behold. Let me get a good look at that. Very precise work, whatever it is. Unusual shape. The object Sam showed us had a glittering metallic framework, and it was about the size of a large clock. There was ivory in it and some transparent crystalline substance. In the center was what looked like a small XP handheld computer. Well? This is only a model, but I believe it is a working model. You can see that this bar appears to pulsate slightly. That's because it holds a powerful ion charge, which is the power supply. You will also notice that the frame is solidly built. In the full-sized machine, a man would sit here. You can see the two control sticks, here and here. Great work, man. It's gorgeous. Thank you, Willie. Willie helped me modify the motherboard in the computer there. So does this model do something? Let's just say, I hope it does. You haven't tested it already? No, I haven't. But, because it took a lot of trouble to build, and because it is too small for anyone to ride on, I have asked you three to witness its operation and tell me what you think. All right. Well, fire it up, man. You mean you really think it will travel in time? I do. But first, take a good look. Look under the table. Don't touch the controls. When you are absolutely satisfied there is no trickery planned, I'll send it off. We all looked at the machine very hard. And I know that, for my part, I had no doubt that the machine was, as Sam would have us believe, a a real object sitting on a table. Now, if I may borrow your finger then, Herb? Huh? Sure, I guess. Press here. There was a breath of wind, and the little machine suddenly spun around on its base and was seen as a swirl of faintly glittering brass and ivory for perhaps a second or two... And then it was gone. It just disappeared. But where did it go? That would be the $64,000 question, wouldn't it? And you want us to believe that that little thing went off traveling in time all by itself? That's right. Into the past or into the future? That I am not absolutely sure of, Willie. You remember there was that question about the polarity of the ions versus the polarity of the chip. Right. Right. But by moving the two sticks, a person riding the machine can control the direction of travel at will. Only when the two control sticks are together, as you saw them at first, will the machine remain fixed in time. So where is it now? It's still right there. But far in the future, or in the past. Traveling through time, because no one is aboard to return the handles to neutral, as it were. Just kneel. I don't have to tell you that if what you're saying is true, your machine's going to be worth a hell of a lot more than $64,000. But how are you going to prove that it works? That's simple, Arliss. I plan to take a ride on the full-sized model next week. Really? (laughs) You mean... I mean I have a full-sized one almost completed out in the garage. I knew it. I knew you had a second one started. May I take a picture of it for the paper? Next time, Herb, if it works. Right now, I want to invite all of you to return in one week, say, next Tuesday at 6.30. Wouldn't miss it. Me neither. You don't actually seem crazy, Sam, so I'll be there. Thanks, Arliss. I'll leave supper ready. If I am not mistaken, I'll have plenty to tell you. Of course, we all showed up early. Though we needn't have bothered, Sam wasn't there. He had left a note on the front door to say that we should 
let ourselves in, and get comfortable in the event that he was delayed. I can't wait all night. I just hope he's okay. He can't have been gone for long. This food's still warm, and there are sodas. He's not in the garage, and neither is his time machine. Hey, cheesesteak subs. Good old Sam. You sound like you've seen it. Hmm, I did. Last week after you all left, he showed it to me. He had a change he wanted me to help him with. What was that? He wanted me to make the control sticks removable. I do machine work for him, too, over at Bernard's. So you saw him last. When exactly? On Saturday? Yeah, Saturday it was. Well, we could call the sandwich place and ask when they saw him. It can't have been long ago. Here's the number. Sam! <laughs> well, well. Uh, good evening. I'm sorry to have kept you. Is that sandwich good, Willie? Mm, sure is. How about you? You okay? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, although I am half starved for a bit of meat. Pass me over one of those? Sure, here. He sat down at the table with real appetite. I thought I noticed him limping, and I wondered if he was injured, but he clearly didn't want to be asked a lot of questions. Now that's more like it. In fact, the first words out of his mouth after he devoured half his sandwich were to silence us all. You must forgive me, but uh, I will not last long enough tonight to argue with any of you. Oh, but you got to uh, help. I will tell you the story, but I can't argue. I must have time to rest and to think. One word. Have you been time traveling? Yes. Oh, oh, <laughs> I've had a truly astonishing adventure, but I guess I'd better start at the very beginning. I went out to the garage at 6 p.m. It was light out, of course. It still is now. And, as I had done many times before, I climbed into the seat of my time machine. Only this time was going to be different. I placed my hands on the control sticks and gently moved the right one forward ever so slightly. Then almost immediately, I advanced the left one the same amount. I felt like I might faint. Uh, uh, uh. And I had that sensation of, of falling you sometimes feel in a dream. And then nothing. But I could see that it was dark outside now. I looked at the clock on the wall and I saw that it read 3.45. Of what day or night? I, I can't be sure, but I thought I noticed things on the workbench looked that they had this morning on entering the place. So I deduced that I had traveled backwards in time to the night previous. So next I steeled myself and pulled the right stick towards me. Only this time, I didn't bring the other one alongside it for a long time. Today came back immediately, and I saw Willie here walk into the garage, look around, scratch his head, and walk out. That's right, I did that. Then, tonight came on, tomorrow flashed by, then night again, then day, and I off into the future for real as i put on speed night followed day like the flapping of a black wing the dim impression of the garage around me seemed presently to fall away and i could see the light overhead more clearly i supposed that the garage had been destroyed and the time machine and i were now sitting in the open air i wondered what would happen if someone were to build a wall right where i was sitting somewhere in the future but quickly put the thought aside for fear that I would lose my nerve and decide to go back. I looked down at my watch and saw that it had hardly advanced past 6.15, since it, like I, was within the field of the machine itself. It would not change, even as I did not. The lunch I had eaten at noon was progressing normally through my bowels, I thought with some odd comfort to myself, and and not some untasted future meal that I might have eaten had I stopped when? Several centuries from today. I'm afraid I, I can't convey the peculiar sensation of chronomotion or time travel. I, I did take a small voice recorder with me along with one or two other items, a, a good pocket flashlight and a knife but I did not have the presence of mind to try recording my impressions while I was actually traveling. 
It's definitely unpleasant at first, not unlike the discomfort I have experienced from some carnival rides I've been on. After a while, I, I got used to it, though. And then, it began to seem like I was on a small sailboat with a low-level headache and a kind of seasick feeling all the time. I now realized I could see the change in light from summer to winter. I counted these pulsations at about three per second. I couldn't see the moon and the stars at all, however. My immediate surroundings were not invisible to me, but they were mostly an, an indistinct blur. The familiar green of vegetation, trees and shrubs, swirled about me, sometimes quite close, but most of the time at some distance. Soon, a fresh series of impressions grew up in my mind, curiosity mainly, as well as a definite sense of dread regarding the changes in humanity that might have taken place in the ages that flickered before my eyes. And so my mind came round to the business of stopping. The danger of colliding with some object that had been placed in the same space that I wished to occupy had occurred to me before, and I had swept the worry aside. Now I began to think that I could never stop safely unless I were to return to the present. But again, I made a conscious effort to put this thought aside. I pushed hard on a left-hand stick. Too hard, probably. The machine whirled about, end over end, and I was flung headlong through the air. There was a clap of thunder close by, and I landed on soft ground. I believe I may have been unconscious for a moment. Then a steady hail began to fall around me, on me, everywhere, and I was immediately soaked to the skin. Uh, uh, oh, damn, ow, oh. Oh. My machine. Uh, uh, there. Doesn't look any worse for wear. I can't believe I didn't think about the likelihood there'd be rain. Maybe I should uh, cover the machine with my jacket. No, it's, uh, it's no use. The thing is soaked. Ah, I'm soaked. <laughs> stupid, stupid me. Spent all my time figuring out how to make this thing work and... Didn't stop to think for one minute what I would do when I got here. <clears throat> well, I know one thing I've got to do. <sighs> now that's better. <clears throat> well, at least I thought to bring this. Test it. Test it. Test it. Test it. All right. I'm standing on a lawn or in a meadow. It's, it's hard to see. It's raining. It began as hail, the kind that could destroy an entire vintage of grapes where I grew up in, in New York State in, in the 20th century. My watch now says 2.35 a.m., that means I've been traveling for eight hours, the time it takes to fly to Rome. Calculating my speed of travel through time in approximately three years per second at maximum speed, I should now be standing in the year... Oh, my God. 92,000. Give or take a few thousand years in either direction. When this rain stops, I'll, I'll tell you what I can see. There it is again. I stood up and looked around. There was the time machine, now mostly dry, standing under a pleasant midday sun. I carefully removed the twin control sticks and slipped them into a pocket in my jacket. My clothes were still quite damp, 
and I wanted to kick myself again for not having thought to wear a knapsack with a few basic supplies. Is that some kind of bird? Uh, let's see. It's 5.45 a.m. Must have slept for three hours. No telling what time it is here, though. Any more than I know what year it really is. It doesn't look like anyone lives here, either. It was then I noticed the statue. It was a large figure, the top of which was lost among the branches of the birch tree I had been sleeping under. It appeared to be made of marble and shaped very much like a winged sphinx. But the wings, instead of being folded against the body, were spread so that the huge creature appeared to hover over the lawn where I was standing. The base was of bronze with a dark green patina. And it occurred to me that no one had tended it or the garden in which it stood for many hundreds of years. Then I heard voices approaching me, coming through the bushes from every direction. I could see men and women of, of slender build and, and none of them taller than four or five feet at the most. Well, hello to you, too. My name is Sam. Sam? Uh, I come from the distant past on that machine. Machine? Uh, yes, Sam. And, and I am Sam. I'm Sam. Sam. That's right. I am Sam. 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 Th that's right. Yes. Say, say. And, and I am a friend. It say Elwan. Elwan. He struck me as being a very beautiful and graceful creature, but indescribably frail. His skin was tan, but, but not as from exposure to the sun. Its color was perfectly uniform in tone, and he had not a blemish or a mark on his face or arms. He was otherwise clothed, like all his companions, in robes of the purest indigo I ever saw. Have you any water? Drink. Another one of them addressed me. It suddenly occurred to me that my voice was too harsh and deep for them, so I simply nodded my head. At once, the little fellow reached up and gently touched my arm. <laughs> he seemed reassured that I was real. And he smiled. The first man also touched me then, and smiled. Ah, Sam Bobek, la Elman? Say, say. This caused the rest of them to relax and smile and, and talk among themselves. And I noticed immediately that they tended to laugh a lot. Or to giggle, almost. In all of my days among these people whom I came to know as the Eloy, I never once saw one of them show the slightest sign of anger. I'm sitting on a cushion on the porch of the large stone temple-like structure where the Eloi, the group that found me, gathered to eat their supper and where they now appear to be going to spend the night. The little folk have been extremely kind to me. I spent much of the afternoon trying to converse with a fellow called Elman. It wasn't too difficult. Their own language is simple, the average sentence length being about two and a half words. His hearing seemed extremely acute and he appeared to be learning my language as quickly as I learned theirs. At sundown, they all went inside, ate supper, which consisted mainly of uncooked fruits and vegetables. Now the moon is up, and I can just make out the statue of the Sphinx about 200 yards away, where my time machine sits among the birches and, oh, uh, rhododendrons. I sure I'm glad I brought a flashlight. In fact... I have yet to see any evidence that the Eloi use fire. At all. If I wasn't certain that no such civilization as this ever existed in New York State, I might think I had traveled into the past instead of into the future. 
The hall behind me is entirely lit, if you can call it that, with what look like natural phosphorescent stones. The sliver of a moon gives more light than they have inside. And yet, they all seem to be having a grand time making music and chattering away as they do, and laughing. I'm okay here, Elman. Hard time. I... Okay. Say, say... Sam Cade in a minute. I held up one finger, then foolishly I pointed to my watch. It's a watch. It tells time. I pointed at the moon and made a sweeping gesture across the sky. Elman seemed troubled by this and, and asked if he could touch the watch. The dial glowed pale green. The numbers changed from 9.59 to 10 p.m. Elman drew back, then frowned. Machine, huh? Say, machine. Mm. It's okay. Machine, bonnet. I tried to reassure him, saying that the watch was bonnet, which I had understood to mean good in their language. But this only appeared to confuse him. He began to back away. I'll be along in a minute. For whatever reason, in the course of 90,000 years, mankind appears to have lost touch with technology. I see no machines or electrical apparatus of any kind anywhere, nor do I even see tools about. It's a safe bet that some are required to build this hall behind me. I wonder who did that. It isn't in the best of repair, and how do they heat it in the winter? Well, this is doubtless just the first of many mysteries to be solved. I must go inside, or my hosts may get the wrong impression. Uh, more tomorrow. It's 10, 13 p.m. Sam Lyman signing off. At first light, the entire community arose and gathered together in the vast central nave of their community building. They ate a breakfast of fruit and a delightful grain they called narthex, or something like that. After breakfast, I took a walk to the top of a nearby hill. I, I think it was the same one we used to call Sugarloaf, and looked down to the southwest where I saw the good old Hudson River flowing southward toward the ocean. This sight reassured me tremendously, as you can imagine. I knew where I was, something I was sure the Eloy did not. Although how useless this knowledge was to be, I had yet to realize. I was also elated because seeing that I was right where I had set out from in three-dimensional space appeared to prove I had succeeded in traveling through time. It was to be the last happy moment I spent in that age. Must be summer from the looks of these blueberries. Huge. I wonder the Eloy haven't picked them. What's this? A well? Hmm. Hello? Hello? <laughs> hmm. Try. Why would anybody dig a well way up here? When I came back down the hill, it was just past 8 a.m., I decided to go check on my time machine. I think it must have been over here. Yes, the statue is there and that clump of rhododendrons. No, maybe this isn't the lawn. Maybe it was... No, no, it was here. Right here. Where the... But wait, this looks like... Yes, this is where I turn the machine right side up. And here, it looks like someone dragged it. These are definitely scrape marks on the lawn. And here's more. It looks like they're headed for the statue. And then they... They just... It, it looks like they go right inside. Hello, 
going there. Open up. Hello. Bet that my machine is. And. And what? Huh. I'm. Damn, what an idiot. Oh, boy. I'm stuck good now. Open the door, damn it! That machine is mine! Mine! Someone, anyone. Let me in. But w this door doesn't look all that strong. Maybe I can slip the lock somehow. No. Nothing doing. I'm just gonna break my knife. And there's no use in making a mess of the door either. It'd just give them. Reason to be angry. Whoever they are. Couldn't have been the Eloy. They would have said something about it. But if it wasn't them, who was it? I, I get the idea. They don't like machines, but... Maybe that's all it is. They didn't like it sitting there, so they put it inside. I better be careful how I ask. Say, say, Elman, heart. It, it, it's a wonderful show, but. Eloy Fiernan, Mato Sam, Mato. I returned to the stone house to find the Eloy preparing to hold some kind of festival or party. I soon learned that the guest of honor was to be me. But. Uh, Sam, thanks you all. They had pitched a brightly colored tent on the lawn below their building, next to a stream that flowed swiftly down in the direction of the Hudson. Vada, it's a winkle. It's a wink drowning. Say, say. The girl had gone under by the time I reached her, but she revived okay once I dragged her onto the shore and was already smiling and laughing again before I left her. That night, I asked Elwan about the time machine. Machine? Say, machine, front and statue, Sam, pose machine. Eli, not pose machine, more like Garna. Morlocks to it. Say, say, Morlock, Pranton statue. But who, who are the Morlocks? Nah, nah, nah. Morlock, Kite, Ploy, Eloy. Morlocks, it seemed, were bad for the Eloy. Elwan rose as if to go, but at that moment, the girl I had rescued appeared from the sleeping aisle to the side of the hall. She seemed completely restored. 
and wore a garland of white flowers in her hair, which glowed in the light of the stones. It's a win too for Wina. Hola, Wina. <laughs> Wina. Hola, Sam. Wina, drosher be Sam. Uh, Sam, na, trema. Wina is very lovely, but... Wina, Sam, win too, harten. <laughs> but... Kale, Kale, Sam Bonek Bloa Wiener, Kale. This happened on the evening of the second day. From that moment, except when I expressly forbade her to, Wiener followed me everywhere. She became my spokesperson and my guide. And in the next six days I was in that age. I learned a lot from her. Yes, I came to love her. But in the end, I wonder if it wouldn't have been better if she had drowned. Day three, raining again. My biggest error, apart from not bringing a chain to lock my machine with, is not to wear a good raincoat, preferably one with lots of pockets. More batteries for my recorder and flashlight would have been a good idea, too. Hola. Sam, come here. Hard ten, Wina. Sam... Kade, say... In one minute? <laughs> say, Wiener, in one minute. <laughs> Wiener and I had our first difference of opinion earlier. Because it's raining, I decided to take a look around the inside of this place. Uh, it's huge. It's also very old. I haven't yet learned whether the Morlocks actually built it or whether it was here from before. Well, before what? I'm not sure before the current age, when everybody still lived together, perhaps. The Morlocks live under the ground, while the Eloi live on top. Who was actually in charge, I can't say as yet. The Eloi seem powerless to get my machine back, though, so I guess sooner or later I'm going to have to deal with these other folks. That isn't going to make the Eloi happy. This morning, while Wien and I were exploring, I discovered a stairway leading down into what must be the basement of this building. Wiena started to flip out. I mean, if you can imagine a lily growing pale, that's what she looked like. I thought she was going to faint for sure, so I told her to sit there while I went down. She began to wail. It was only when I showed her my flashlight that she agreed to let me go. But it was all for nothing, because right away I came to a pair of bronze doors, heavier than the one on the base of the Sphinx, and I had to turn back. But after lunch... I'm going to test a little theory of mine about the, the well I saw on the hillside. This way, Wiener. Come. Wiener, not peely peely. Wiener, baku. What's that? Wiener, go slow. Eat peely peely. Blueberries. Say, say. Peely peely, bobek. Sam Brana, Eloy. <laughs> Sam eat blueberries, too? Many times, Wina, on this very hill. Well, many years ago. Too fast. Here, eat. Hard ten. Wina, where do the Eloy get their food? Food? Uh, pili pili. Skorati. Uh, kistati. Oh, Morlock bring. More luck take away. <laughs> Kade, Sam. Sam and Wiener go back? No, Wiener. I, I want to take another look from up here. Look? I was up here yesterday. I thought I saw... But yes, there. Lade Ipse? A building. I don't know why, but it looks promising. What is promising? Uh, like, maybe I can find tools there. Make fire. Kade. We go back now? <laughs> Wiener coming. On the way back, we came upon the strange dry well I had noticed on my earlier visit. Wiener clearly wanted to have nothing to do with it. A wheel, Sam? Yet a Morlock. What about the Morlocks, Wiener? What is it for? Morlock had Daru. Morlock go in and Morlock come out. Well, if the Morlock can, so can I. Nah, Sam. Yet a Morlock. Let Sam worry about them. Sure enough, there are handholds. Itiri, not Bobek. Don't forget it. I've got my flashlight. Morlock, not a Ipsy flashlight. Sam, not Dukida. One. No, no, no. Two. Your 
It was still light out when I began my descent, and I could see around me in the shaft for quite a while. A dull, rhythmic throbbing like heavy machinery rose in warm air from below. I had not gone far when I reached the first lateral level to my right. I paused, clinging to the rungs, and peered into the darkness. A pair of large eyes reflecting the dim light from above was fixed on me. If these were the folks who had taken my machine, I must neither offend them nor act afraid. Hello? Who's there? The eyes immediately darted sideways, out of sight. Not a greeting. The air was warmer now, and the sound of industry below me was growing louder. So this was what made the idyllic world of the Eloy possible. A vast underground network of tunnels and workspaces inhabited by a race of workers, the Morlocks, who rarely, if ever, saw the light. My right hand closed on the flashlight in my pocket. We did. Yes, but... Why don't you come here? Don't you know what is forbidden for us, Eloy? Forgive me, but I am not Eloy. I am Sam Lyman. I have come here from the distant past. Please... There was a scuffling, and I felt someone or something slip by me in the near total darkness of the place. I could barely make out a bipedal creature, a, a bit shorter than myself, but broader in the shoulders. It seemed to be pale gray in color. And I wasn't sure but what it was actually luminescent. It vanished through a door somewhere in front of me. I resisted the urge to leap back onto the ladder which I still gripped with my left. But to flee now would serve nothing. And I really wanted one thing and one thing alone, to get my machine back. So I stood there. All the while I waited, my mind was trying to come to grips with what was going on around me, of course. Again, it occurred to me that I had been pretty stupid thinking only about how to travel in time and spending little or no time at all figuring out why or what I would do once I succeeded. Had I done this for money, which is what some people might think, or, or for pure science and a, and a place in history? Or was it for the fun of hanging out in the garage with Willie and building the machine? A bit of each, perhaps. But I hadn't really thought this through. Pretty dumb. You... Are you come with me? Um, uh, I, I can't do that. Why not? You came this far, okay? You come with me. I, uh, look, can't I just get my machine back? First, you must talk to my boss. Then I will get my machine back. Uh, perhaps. After month's end, maybe. Until then, you remain here. Huh? Come. Uh, I... Uh, I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Come. I can't see. Uh, good. That way you know trouble to Morlock. Now, come. In one movement, I whipped the flashlight out of my pocket, aimed it, and switched it on. Ah! In a split uh, second, it took my own eyes to adjust to the no! of light. I saw the ugliest, most misshapen human-like creature... Hey! His huge eyes were tightly shut, and he was twisted up as if the light on his skin alone was enough to cause him pain. Turn that light off. I wasted no time beginning my ascent. Come back! I held the flashlight aimed downward behind me until I reached the first lateral. I don't 
get my machine back. <laughs> Day four, evening. I returned to the surface to find Weena gone. She'd made it back to the hall on her own, okay. She hasn't mentioned my going down into the tunnel, although I think I detected a look of relief when I returned. My exploration has given me plenty to think about. Although one thing appears more and more certain. Sometime in the 90,000 years since my era, mankind has coalesced into two groups. One which laughs and plays all the time, and one that is grim and serious. One which inhabits the world of sunshine, and the other which lives beneath the earth in a network of tunnels and workspaces whose dimensions I can only guess at. Relations between these two groups are less clear to me. The Eloi depend on the Morlocks to bring them food and to clean up after them. Who knows but what the Morlocks actually built this place for them as well. Almost certainly the Eloi did not. I have yet to see one of them pick up anything heavier than a piece of fruit. I also have no idea what it is the Morlocks get in return. Hola, Sam. Sam, come inside now? No, we not. Sam is fine, right here. Uh, shh. Listen. Lovely, no? Huh? Come inside. We not sing. Perhaps later. Sam, come. Moon almost gone. Yet a Morlock. Sam has light, Wiener. Now Na fear Morlock. Eloy fear Morlock. I'll be along soon. <laughs> In a minute? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the moon, which was entering its final quarter when I arrived, is now almost gone. This seems to be of some concern to my friends, the Eloy, although it may be a good thing for me. That more like I spoke to said nothing could happen regarding my machine until the month was out. Did he mean the new moon, I wonder? In any case, tomorrow I'm going over toward the river to inspect that building I saw over there. Maybe I'll find tools to open the door in the base of that statue. I'm not sure the time machine is still in there, of course, but I think it's worth a try. More later. Rina? This way, girl. Coming! <laughs> Whatever her concern had been, in the morning, Rina seemed thrilled at the idea of a walk to the river. I later realized this was because it was in the opposite direction from the tunnel opening. We saw plenty more of those as we walked, however. Rina said nothing about them. Rina find flowers. Lovely. Just look at those. Some kind of foxglove. For Sam. <laughs> here. Oh, more for me? I wait, here. Put them in here. Heart and Wiener. Sam and Wiener reach building Eta? Then go in? Eta, Wiener. We go in. Wow. Unreal. Unreal? Very nice. Big. Like a museum, I think. What means a uh, Museum. A place to show special things. Look here. It was once a museum of natural history, perhaps. But when it last had visitors, was anybody's guess. <coughs> what? Oh, no, that's a that's a bear. I, I, don't worry. It, it can't hurt you. You see, it's uh, it's safe in its own glass house. The building was designed to make good use of sunlight though much of the glass in its windows was broken. There was lots of light everywhere. Weena? Weena? You didn't... Oh, there you are. What have you found? See, stars. Stars in house. Now, Weena. Diamonds. Diamonds under glass. Diamonds? Stones. Stones? So bright, like stars. Very pretty, yes. 
Weena smiles. Weena has? Uh, sure. If I can get him out of there. Uh, let's see. Um, ah, this, uh, this chair ought to do it. Here. For Weena. To wear. Again, again. Oh, oh. Ow, uh, careful. Oh, oh, you've cut yourself. Oh, oh, oh. I'm like five. Here, ho- hold finger, so. So. Fire hurt, Weena. Yes. Come on. Find real fire. Fire here? I hope so, and, and tools. Tools? Yes, to open door. Then you and I, uh, uh, then Weena and Sam, go. Leave Morlocks. Come. I was wrong about finding any tools, but we did find a box of kitchen matches and a showcase on the uses of natural sulfur. There were two dynamite caps as well, and my heart pounded because I knew that with these, I could blow the doors off of anything. But from the weight of them, I knew right away they were dummies for display only. Not far away, I found a supply of paraffin wax, which I thought would make a great firebomb should I ever want to light things up down in the world of the Morlocks. I was growing convinced that the only way I would reach my time machine again was underground. Before leaving the museum, I managed to remove a leg from one of the showcases, a length of steel tube with a flat metal bracket bolted to one end. This would serve me as a weapon, if nothing else. Weena kill Nade, Sam. Hurry now. What's the matter, Weena? Ips a lot of hirtendela. Night of long shadows. Morlock Kade. Morlock Kade? Where? Everywhere. Tonight Morlock come. Take Eloy. Go. What? It, it was then that I learned from Weena what I had only guessed at until then. This was the other half of the hideous deal that bound this world together, what the Eloy gave to the Morlock. The answer was themselves. One night a month, the Morlocks emerged to harvest the Eloy at will. Morlock, Atke, Tade. Atke, Eloy. Eloy, more. As she told me the story, my thoughts wandered from the trail to the world below ground, to the livid gray creatures I had seen. And we went a little bit off our course. I wasn't worried about this at first because I was sure we still had two hours of light ahead of us. Then I saw what Weena probably knew all along. On this day, the Morlocks were not going to wait until full dark. Already they were starting to appear in ones and twos outside their tunnels. For some way, I heard nothing but the crackling of twigs under our feet, the faint rustle of the breeze above, and the rhythm of our breath as we hurried on our way. But it was too late. Stand back! You, there! Weena, get over here! No, Sam! No use! What the hell do you mean? Watch this! In an instant, I had a square of paraffin out and stuck to the steel bar. I lit it. I flew! Fire! (laughs) The Morlock stepped back, but he didn't seem half as bothered by the light as his fellows below ground had. I considered trying my flashlight instead, but its batteries were almost gone. And now the Morlocks were all around us. We're going to have to run for it, Weena. Run? Where? Uh, that way. You go first, that way I can see you. Sam, go first. Weena, stay. What? But, 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 but that's crazy. Get ah! back, you! Ah! Ah! Sam, save Weena from River. Maybe Weena, save Sam. No, Weena, no! Weena took one step from me and was immediately seized by eager hands. She didn't resist or even cry out. I stood in frozen anguish for a second, and several other Morlocks came at me. I dove after Weena, but she was gone. Out of my way. Go on, get back. The remaining Morlocks began to back away. I thought it was I who was driving them back. Then I noticed the light flickering off the trees, and I realized that my torch had set the woods on fire all around me. Oh, my God, what have I done? No! I began to run, 
Of course, I wanted to get back to the statue where I still presumed my machine to be, but I had no idea where I was. Meanwhile, the fire spread no! rapidly. No! Coming up the hillside, I saw a group of Morlocks, dazzled by the light and heat, blunders straight into the flames. The cries were awful, and I realized how completely helpless and miserable they were in the glare, and I, and I struck no more of them. For most of that night, I was persuaded that it was all a nightmare. I screamed and called upon whatever God might be listening, and yes, I even pinched myself in the hope that I would wake up, but it was no use. Finally, I, I stumbled into a stream. I thought it might be the same one from which I had rescued Weena, so I stopped and waited for dawn. Day 7. I've now been traveling for two full days since leaving the Eloy and the Morlocks. The sun is growing redder and redder, and I think I'll stop soon. I still don't really know who took my machine back there. When I got back to the lawn by the Sphinx, it was just sitting there, right where I had left it. I thought that was pretty weird, but on reflection, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I wasn't much used to anybody, and after I started that fire, I guess either the Eloy or the Morlocks could have concluded they'd be better off if I cleared out. I am going to stop again now, but after what happened, this time, I think I'll just stay aboard and look around. Wow. Now, this is different. But that looks like the ocean. It must have risen a hundred feet or else the continent is sinking. I wonder what the water is like. No, 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 no. No, you don't, Sam, old man. And are you ever old? Let's see, um... Three years per second, times 48 hours. I must have traveled a half a million years. Oh, it's cold. It sure doesn't look like mankind made it. Neither Eloy nor Morlock. I should at least climb down and collect some specimens or something. I could use a, a pit stop and a stretch. But I mustn't go far. The machine was standing on a sloping beach. The lead-colored sea stretched away to the southwest toward a sharp horizon under a pale pink sky. Uh, but what the dickens was that? Could it have been a... Yikes, that's a, 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 a butterfly. It's huge. I wonder if... Oh, my God, look at that monster. A reddish mass I had thought to be a rock suddenly rose up on eight spindly legs. It was a huge crab. Its eyes popped up on stalks and it unfolded two massive pincers. Oh, God. Oh, baby, get me out of here. Oh! Ow! Oh. I was almost too slow. The big thing got a hold of the machine with one claw and gave us a shake. It was about to go for me, but I managed to jam the steel bar in its other claw. And the next moment, we were gone. I suppose I could have killed the thing and had one heck of a crab bake before coming home. But I didn't. It somehow seemed so special to me. I know it couldn't be an endangered species, but I, I don't think I could ever kill something as highly evolved as that. As I traveled back here, I had plenty of time to think about all of that and my lack of attention to these things before I set out. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that nothing I was doing justified the loss of anyone's life, not one person's. At the end of human time, there was still that, the Eloy and the Morlocks both. Not, not even a single crabs. No matter how big, huh? Right. Wow. What a story. You want it, Herb? It's yours. This food, it's the spot. But, well, how will anybody believe it, Sam? I don't know. How can I prove it, Alice? Well, did you bring back any specimens? Not from the beach, no. I do have these flowers Weena kept stuffing in my pockets for whatever they're worth. 
Let me look at them. What about the machine itself? What about it? Where is it? Is is it okay? Sure, it's out in the garage. It's a bit banged up from my little waltz with that crab, but it, it works all right. Can we look at it? Of course. That's why I invited you, Jay. Hey, you didn't take any pictures, did you? I could really use some for the article. No, I didn't. But I do have this. The Eloy depend on the Morlocks to bring them food and to clean up after them. Who knows but what the Morlocks actually built this place for them as well. Almost certainly the Eloy did not. I have yet to see one of them pick up anything heavier than a piece of fruit. I also have no idea what it is the Morlocks get in return. Oh, no, Sam. Sam come inside now? No, we're not. Sam is fine, right here. Shh. Listen. Wow. That was Weena? Yes, Willie. That is Weena. Because she is still there. In part of the future, she is still alive. I could go back there and rescue her again, couldn't I? Sheesh, I, I'll be damned if I understand it all myself. Look, come on, Herb. Let's go and look at the machine, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. We all went out to the garage with him, and we saw the machine, and it was exactly as he had said. There were bits of moss and something that looked like seaweed on the landing skids. I don't think Miss Kellett has ever succeeded in identifying any of the samples Sam let her take away. We all said good night to him. I shared a cab home with Jay Hoffman, the patent attorney. He thought the whole thing was a well-constructed lie. And uh, what did you think, Mr. Wells? Well, I felt otherwise. And I spent the whole night drafting an article about Sam's story. I never published it, however. The next day, I called him up to check some of the statements in the article. But there was no answer. After several tries, I went over to his house. And by then, I suspected what I would find. There was no one there. I went around to the garage and looked inside. The machine had also vanished. That was three years ago. And no one has seen Sam Lyman since. 